Hi there, I'm your host, John Iverson. Welcome to our jaundiced view of a week in politics. As usual, I'm joined by Marcella Monroe, who is the owner-operator of WPM Public Affairs, and Andrew Balfour, who is the managing partner of Rubicon Strategies. Welcome all. Um, this week, we're going to look at Conservative premiers in peril in Ontario and Alberta. We'll give an update on vaccines at, and the border, just as Justin Trudeau heads to uh, the G7 in Cornwall. And we're going to take a look at the time-honoured tradition of MPs crossing the floor in order to uh, enhance their electoral prospects uh, with the news that uh, Green MP Jenica Atwin is going to join the Liberals. So each week we seem to take a pop at Doug Ford and Jason Kenney, but really it's because each week they oblige us by doing something stupid. <laughs> and both of them this week, in my opinion, have done something pretty stupid. Um, let's start with uh, Doug Ford, who said he's going to use the notwithstanding clause to overturn a court decision he doesn't like. The first time that an Ontario premier has used the nuclear option available to all premiers and prime ministers. Um, Meanwhile, Kenny is affirming that he will uh, have a referendum on equalisation in the fall, even though it won't impact the Canadian Constitution or the equalisation programme one bit, regardless of the result. Starting in Ontario, uh, some background. In successive elections, a, a group of unions banded together under the, the, the Working Families Coalition title, and in my opinion, essentially bought the election. They, they, were, uh, they banded together, put up millions and millions of dollars in advertising, all aimed at undermining the Conservative leader at the time, Ernie Eves, Tim Hudak. Um, third party advertising is not allowed federally. It was allowed provincially, but it was so egregious that, the, that even the Liberals decided to reform the Electoral Financing Act in 2017 and limit the amount that, a, that third parties could spend to $600,000 uh, within the six-month period before the writ. Now, Doug Ford supported that, but he then introduced an amendment that extended the six-month period to 12 months. That has now been overturned by a court in Ontario, which has said that is uh, an infringement on the Charter right to freedom of expression. And Ford has responded by saying he's going to use the notwithstanding clause to override the court. Um, that seems to me to be uh, not a great idea. Um, you know, obviously, Andrew, he had the, the existing six-month period in his back pocket. So why would he risk public opprobrium on extending it to 12 months and using the notwithstanding clause? It just seems to be using a sledgehammer to crack a walnut. Well, I think first that most Ontarians don't know what the notwithstanding clause is, probably don't particularly care too much about it, don't know what working families is. Um, but it's pretty obvious they did it so that working families and the big unions like Unifor can't go and run big campaigns against them with millions of dollars up until the writ. I mean, the people that this upsets are not a Mr. Ford voter. We can have a discussion about if this was the right thing to do and whether it's appropriate, but <clears throat> the politics of it are pretty simple and straightforward. Marcello, we've seen the uh, the government in Quebec fr under Francois Legault use this Section 33 uh, notwithstanding clause on two occasions so far, Bill 21 and Bill 96, the, the official languages uh, provision that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Do you think that we're seeing a growing trend of people using this this clause, which has been around, but, uh, you know, Jean, Jean Chrétien, I think, when he introduced it, said it should only be used in absurd cases. Yeah, I mean, I think it's starting to be abused. Um, I think Quebec was the sort of um, early adapter to using the notwithstanding clause. Uh, and now we're seeing two very, in my view, desperate uh, conservative premiers. Um, I mean, in, in the House in Alberta, they also talked about using it. Um, and now we have Doug Ford using it flat out. So while I agree with Andrew that it's not exactly a household issue, um, I think it's a little bit dangerous. And I think it's dangerous in, in the fact that the federal government has been fairly silent on this uh, and that if it's going to become basically just a straight up partisan political tool, which was not the purpose of including it in the Constitution Act, um, then we're going to have we're going to weaken the charter. I don't think there's any question about that. And it opens the door um, to the use of this 
clause, which, as you quoted Chrétien saying, was there basically as an emergency, you know, to pull the emergency lever, um, instead to use it to basically oppose whatever court decision, whatever federal policy that, that they see fit to make to score political points. And I just think it's very dangerous. Moving on to Alberta, uh, Jason Kenney has consistently been behind in the polls to Rachel Notley's NDP um, He's now talking about a referendum on uh, equalization, which does seem to be a bit of a deflectory tactic. Marcella? <laughs> well, to say something, I mean, he's he wrote this current equalization when he was part of the Harper government. So the fact that he's now railing against it and um, saying he's going to have a referendum uh, is, is quite ironic in lots of ways. But look, we know what's going on here. He has uh, he ha- he is back in the polls, the, 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 the Wild Rose Independence Party, which doesn't even really have a permanent leader at this point, is pulling at 20 percent to the UCP's 30 percent. He's desperately looking for a way to try and put his Humpty Dumpty coalition back together again. Uh, and he's trying to change the channel hard because he's just had day after day of him and his people making bad tone deaf decisions. Uh, dining out in the Sky Palace that no premier should ever set foot on, ever. Uh, It's a third rail in Albertan politics. Um, You know, and lots of rumors now about him also dining out at a a secret restaurant. I mean, they're denying all of this. But the point is that day after day, having these kind of issues uh, in front of the Alberta public is just not good for him. I think he's in serious trouble. What do you think, Andrew? Do you agree? Oh, I mean, this obviously uh, a diversion, but... um you know, the, he's got all these issues around that, but the bigger issue that they're going to have problems with is what he announced uh, the other day about how their vaccination rates are flatlining. And, you know, he tied his opening with the stampede and everything to vaccination numbers. And he basically said the other day that they only have 100,000 appointments over the next seven days. If you think about that in terms of Ontario, Ontario does 150, 160,000 a day. And there's people lining up. So, you know, the vac- vaccination hesitancy out there is significant. There's also polling that shows that, you know, Albertans of any province are the most opposed to any form of vaccine passport or tracking, whereas even, you know, Manitoba, where they're having a disaster, he's announced a vaccine passport and now he's announced the lottery. Like, the the race for the dumbest province is live and well right now. But also, Alberta's got these rolling in economic problems, right? So we know now that the, the pipeline that they bet $1.5 billion on of public money is gone. We also saw the energy industry come out yesterday, uh, the big players, and basically saying, we will commit to zero emissions from the oil sands by 2050. And you could see that the government of Alberta was begrudgingly okay, I guess so, right? So there's a lot on the horizon that, that he's going to have to deal with. It's, this, it, it's not just about COVID anymore for him. Well, and they did the big hydrogen thing. It's, you know, there's a lot going on out there. And I don't, just one last comment. I know we don't have a lot of time. Good, because I want to get a word in edgewise at some point. (laughs) On the the referendum, it is like, again, it's like not binding. But when you saw them announce it, this goes back to their fair deal panel. And that, to your point, is all about getting their electoral coalition back together. This is about bringing them back on this red meat to the base. Because, you know, Alberta is so hard done by. Moving on to... uh, to COVID, though, we've got uh, Justin Trudeau going to Cornwall. Um, President Joe Biden has already committed to 500 million doses of uh, vaccine being donated to uh, COVAX, the, the initiative that uh, is meant to distribute vaccine to developing countries. Um, Canada's ordered 122 million doses. We only need 76 million doses for to fully vaccinate the, the country. Marcella, do you think we should be immediately donating 50 million to uh, to COVAX? I think 100% we should. And as I've said before, not to be a broken record on this, we have a major problem happening, uh, particularly in countries much poorer than ours, right? Because their re- levels of vaccin- vaccination uh, are just abysmal. And if we don't solve that problem, especially if we're going to open the borders, then we're going to have an, a new variant that's going to be really tough. We're going to have to go through the lockdown all over again. 
Um, so it's not just the best thing to do because we're good human beings that, that understand that this could have massive death tolls in other countries, but it's also self-serving to make sure we keep protecting ourselves. Well, I was going to say on the, on the border, I mean, do you think we're going uh, at the right pace, too fast, too slow? I mean, at the moment, uh, Canadians who are fully vaccinated when they come back uh, come July will not have to stay in a quarantine hotel. But obviously, there are still concerns about this, particularly this Delta variant, which is now in, in Britain, for example, is the predominant variant. Well, but I mean, yeah, though we saw some announcement yesterday, but, you know, Americans who are double vaccinated will still have to stay in quarantine hotels, but we can go there and there's no quarantine. I, I think that what we're starting to see, and I'm hearing this a lot from clients and from other people in America, particularly Canadians who live in America, um, America is getting pretty angry about this. You know, President Biden announced yesterday all these committees and candidates seem to not know that this was coming, uh, that you can tell like, all the Northern Border Caucus, all the Northern Governors Caucus, it's like th these people are starting to just be unhappy. And I think what's going to end up happening is that the U.S. is just not going to renew the border rules come June 22nd or June 21st, the way you, however you want to look at it. Are you expecting to see the restrictions lifted on June 22nd? No, I think that what's going to happen is that the Americans are just going to say, well, it's open. Um, now over to you, Prime Minister, yep. and he's going to have to make some tough decisions because if Canadians can all of a sudden just go into America, then <laughs> he's got a tough spot if we're still not going to let them, them in. Especially with the tourism industry, right? Because our tourism industry is is praying that they can open up this summer. You could see it being lopsided for a month or so, though. Yes. Um, but I mean, just a quick one last quick thing on that is, you know, so let's say that July 1st comes, and I'm making up July 1st as a date. I hop on a flight. I go down to visit friends in D.C. I still haven't got my second shot. I got my second shot there. Well, if I come back right away, I'm still going to have to do a quarantine hotel. But if I wait and stay in America and spend my money in America for 14 days, then I can come back and not do a quarantine hotel. Uh, you know, I think that we should rather want Canadians spending their money in Canada, but, but that policy seems to be designed to do the opposite. All right, well, let's wrap up talking about uh, Jenica Atwin, who has uh, joined the Liberal Party from the Greens, um, leaves the Greens with two MPs in the House, apparently sparked by infighting in the Green Party, um, now led by Anami Paul. What are you hearing, Andrew? Well, yeah, I mean, it doesn't sound like a good time over there. They've had all these people resign. It's also, if you look at it for the Liberals, that the Greens took out a Liberal incumbent in that seat last time, and now the chances that this is a, a hold are quite high, and if you're Justin Trudeau and you're trying to get to your majority number of 170, you, know, you need the holds, and so this is just one more. There's not a lot of growth in Atlanta, Canada, so right. it's a good place to be. Uh the Greens, prior to the 2011, uh, 2019 election, were, were polling north of 10%. A lot of people were open to voting Green. That doesn't seem to be the case at the moment. Uh, Marcella, what do you think? If, if people don't vote Green, where does that vote go? Well, first of all, high five to the PMO for leaking this right in the middle of the Ethics Committee report. <laughs> That's, that was a pretty nice little Pure turn. coincidence. Yeah, total fluke. Beautiful. Uh, really well done. Um, look, uh, this is one thing I've always lectured my new Democrat friends about it. There's a there's a false there's a false assumption that if you can collapse the green vote, that that vote automatically will go to the NDP. That's not true. We know that's not true from years of polling data. The green vote is very specific. It's a highly educated vote. It's a vote of people who basically, regardless of what they might have thought of their political stripes, um, basically feel we're not doing enough on conservation and the environment. Uh, and so those people are just as likely to be more comfortable voting liberal than New Democrat. And I think that that vote, if they can collapse it, if that's part of what the liberals are doing here, um, can be very important to them in marginal seats, not just in New Brunswick, but potentially across the country. Um, and I don't think I think that the liberals have also taken such a. Um, progressive stance on a lot of climate action uh, that it would be very hard for Jagmeet Singh, Singh and the NDP to fight them on that. 
So I think uh, it's a it's a big challenge. I think the green vote could be um, quite useful for the liberals, and it's a smart move. It does. I think too that if you could easily, if you're the liberals and you're trying to like make the Greens look bad, you just point out that their leader A doesn't have a seat, but B can't run a caucus of three. So you know how's she going to run a country? That's a fair point. Anyway, we're going to wrap it up there. Thank you very much, guys. We'll speak again next week. Cheers. Thanks. Bye.